What's going on besties? In this video, we're going to be talking about solving equations for one variable and estimation. Let's get started. So on the ATITs, it's going to be crucial that you understand some vocabulary terms when it comes to algebra. Here you can see we have an algebraic expression 15x plus 5. There are going to be four key terms that are consistently going to be used when you're taking your test. It's going to be coefficient, variable, term, and constant. So let's begin with the term variable. So variables are elements within an expression whose values are not fixed. They represent letters of unknown quantities. In our given example that we have here, the one variable we have x represents the quantities that are not immediately known without needing additional information. Next up we have our constant. So in our example, the constant is the number that is represented by the number 5. It's labeled as a constant because it stands alone without any variable attached to it. Unlike variables, whose values might change depending on specific conditions or inputs, a constant remains the same within the expression. Therefore, any number that appears by itself, not accompanied by a variable, is considered a constant in algebraic expressions. Next up, we have coefficient. And a coefficient is a number that multiplies by a variable within the expression. So for instance, in our example, our coefficient is actually 15. Coefficients and variables are paired together in multiplication relationships. And when they are written, that number, our coefficient, always precedes the variable. And finally, let's talk about terms. So in an algebraic expression, a term refers to a component that is delineated by addition or subtraction symbols. So for example, in our expression, 15x and 5 each represent distinct terms. So essentially, terms are the building blocks of an algebraic expression, excluding the operators that is our addition and subtraction themselves. Although the concept of terms might not be the primary focus, it's crucial to understand because it underpins the structure of algebraic expressions. Another important concept that you're going to need to know is inverse arithmetic operations. So this principle revolves around the question, what do we add, subtract, multiply, or divide into a number for it to result in zero? To illustrate this concept, consider an example where we're looking to find what can be added to a positive number in order to result in zero. Given that x is a positive number, the additive inverse would be negative x, its negative counterpoint. Therefore, if you add x to negative x, you're going to get zero. They essentially cancel each other out. In our next example, we're dealing with a negative value, negative x. To find what needs to be added to achieve zero, we use that additive inverse concept, meaning that we need to add the opposite. So negative x plus positive x is going to equal zero, demonstrating the inverse property of addition. Not too bad, right? Now let's dive into inverse property of multiplication. This principle is centered around identifying what number, when multiplied by another, is going to yield 1. Essentially, any number times its multiplicative inverse or reciprocal equals 1. So for our first example, consider the letter B where b is a whole number and not a fraction. It's actually quite helpful to represent b in its fractional form as b over 1, where any whole number can be expressed as a fraction over 1. To find the reciprocal, we invert the fraction, making the denominator the new numerator and the numerator the new denominator. Therefore, the reciprocal of b is actually 1 over b. To verify this, let's multiply b in its fractional form as b over 1 by its reciprocal 1 over b. When multiplying fractions, we multiply the numerators together and the denominators together. Starting with our numerator, we have b times 1 is going to give us b. And with our denominators, we have 1 times b is also going to give us b. This is ultimately going to give us b over b, which further simplifies into the number 1. We may also encounter a fraction of 1 over b. In order to identify the reciprocal, we simply flip the fraction, resulting in b over 1. And just like we did in our previous example, when we multiply our numerators and our denominators together, we are going to simplify it to b or that's also going to equal 1. 
Let's take a look at some examples for solving equations using one variable. So when we're performing these operations, we want to perform the opposite or inverse operation of whatever we are doing on one side of the variable to the other side of our equation. So our first example, we have x minus 6 equals 13. So we want to isolate x in order to find out what that number is. So what we're going to do is, just like we did before, we're going to do the inverse. So we have a negative 6. We're going to add a positive 6 to both sides. Adding a positive 6 is going to give us x equals 19. We just solved our first equation. In our next example, we have 3x plus 9 equals 0. So again, we want to isolate x first. So we do that by minusing 9 from both sides. Because here we had a positive 9. We want to make sure that we minus 9 in order to achieve 0. Once we do that, we're going to get 3x is equal to negative 9. And now we need to, again, isolate that x. So how are we going to do that? We are going to go ahead and divide by 3 on both sides in order to get rid of that 3 coefficient before our variable. That is going to give us x is equal to negative 3. Our next example, we have 15 equals 5m. So again, we want to isolate that variable. That's our m. So we're going to divide 5 by both sides, and that is going to give us 3 is equal to m. And our last example may seem a little bit tricky, but actually it's really quite simple. We have 11 is equal to w divided by 3. So again, we want to isolate our variable. We want to get that w on one side by itself. In order to do that, we're going to multiply each side by 3 because that is the inverse operation, and that is going to give us 33 is equal to w. Not too bad, right? So next up, we're going to solve proportions with one variable. So you're going to see two fractions with an equal sign between them, and you're going to have to solve for whatever the variable is, whether it's x or another letter. So in order to do this, we're going to cross multiply fractions to obtain an equation with one variable. So we do this by cross multiplication of our fractions. Our first problem is going to give us 10x is equal to 60. So now we have an algebraic expression and we just need to solve for x. So we do so by dividing each side by 10 and that is going to give us x is equal to 6. Let's try another example. So down here we have x over 3 is equal to 4 over 6. So again, we are going to cross multiply our fractions and that is going to give us 6x is equal to 12. We have our algebraic expression, so we're going to go ahead and we're going to divide each side by 6 to isolate x and that is going to give us our correct answer of x is equal to 2. For our next example, we have 7 over x is equal to 14 over 28. So again, we're going to cross multiply our proportions. And that is going to give us 14x is equal to 196. We're dealing with big numbers now, right? We are again going to isolate our x by dividing each side by 14. And that is going to give us our correct answer of x is equal to 14. Hopefully this has helped bridging some gaps in understanding how we cross multiply proportions. So let's move on to our final example. So we have 5x, 5 over x is equal to 10 over 20. So we're going to go ahead and cross multiply. This is going to give us 10x is equal to 100. And of course, we're going to divide each side by 10 in order to isolate x. And that is going to give us our final example of x is equal to 10. So let's talk about estimation. On the ATITs, you're going to have to use your best judgment in regards to length, weight, and capacity when it comes to various items. So starting with the estimation involving length, you're going to be using metric system conversions. It is a crucial skill that you're going to need to know for the ATITs as well as healthcare. So choosing the appropriate unit of measurement depends on the object that you are measuring. If you haven't already done so, I highly recommend that you go check out my video on metric conversions because it's going to help you break down the differences between each unit and how we establish each one. But let's take a look at how the ATITs is going to test you when it comes to this. So when it comes to length, there's a couple different things that you will need to know. You're going to need to know meter, centimeter, millimeter, and kilometer. 
So starting with the meter, just to give you real life examples, one meter tall is about the height of a doorknob. So when you look at your doorknob, that is about the height of one meter. When we're talking about centimeter, we're talking about the width of a paper clip. That's approximately one centimeter. When we're talking about millimeter, that is approximately one millimeter is the diameter of a grain of salt. It's really, 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 really tiny. It's not the length of the grain of salt, it's that diameter, that cut through. And then lastly, with kilometer, when we think of kilometer, one kilometer is equal to an airport runway. So if you've ever been in an airplane, you know that runway is very long. That is approximately one kilometer. Next up, we have weight. So approximately when it comes to weight, a gram is equal to the weight of a paper clip. So that paper clip's not very heavy, right? So it's very, very light. So that's approximately one gram. Next up, we have milligram. So one milligram is essentially the same weight as a pinch of salt, so not very big. And then lastly, kilogram. So one kilogram is approximately the weight of one bag of rice. And last up, we have capacity. So one liter, if you look at those large water bottles, even like this water bottle, right? This water bottle is approximately one liter. Then we have milliliter. So this is huge in healthcare. So one milliliter is just like a small medication dropper amount of liquid. And then lastly, we have a kiloliter. So a kiloliter is approximately the entire capacity of a pool of water. So let's take a look at some examples of how this will be tested on the T's. So starting with question one, what is the best estimate for a length of a standard kitchen knife? So we're talking about the length. So is it 20 millimeters, 200 centimeters, 30 centimeters, or three kilometers? So taking a look back at our examples, we know that a standard kitchen knife is not gonna be as small as 20 millimeters, right? That's that diameter of our grain of rice. So we can automatically eliminate A. And it's definitely not as long as 200 centimeters. Think about it, 200 paper clips widths. That's way too long. So we can automatically eliminate that as well. And then of course, three kilometers, that would be three airport runways. So we definitely know that that is also not our correct answer. That of all the ones that we have available to us, C, 30 centimeters is going to be the most correct answer. Our next question is, what is the most appropriate unit an estimate for the weight of a car? Is it A, 1500 grams, B, 1.5 kilograms, C, 1,500 kilograms, or D, 15,000 milligrams. So in order to answer this question, we have to know that cars are significantly heavier than small objects measured in grams and milligrams. So we can automatically eliminate anything that has grams or milligrams from our question. So now we're just left with kilograms. So if you didn't already know, one kilogram is actually equal to 2.2 pounds. That's actually a conversion that's gonna be really important for you to know. So if you think about it, 1.5 kilograms is just a little over three pounds. So we can automatically eliminate that. Based on all of the answers that we have available to us, C, 1500 kilograms is gonna be the most correct answer. And our last question states, which is the closest estimate for the total volume of a bathtub filled with water? Is it A, 150 milliliters, B, 150 liters, C, 15 centiliters, or D, 1.5 kiloliters? So again, using our deduction of real world examples of how to measure objects, we know that a bathtub with water has to contain way more than 150 milliliters. So we can automatically eliminate that. And of course, 15 centiliters isn't gonna cut it, so we can eliminate that. So we're left with 150 liters and 1.5 kiloliters. Well, when you think about it, 1.5 kiloliters is gonna be excessively more than what we're gonna be able to fill up a bathtub with. Remember, one kiloliter is equal to the size of a swimming pool, the amount of water that's in that swimming pool. So we can automatically eliminate that. So based out of the, all of the answers that we have available to us, B, 150 liters is going to be the correct answer. I hope that this video is helpful in understanding how to solve equations with one variable as well as estimation. 
As always, if you have any questions, make sure that you leave them down below. I love answering your questions. Head over to nursechunkstore.com where there's a ton of additional resources to help you ace that ATITs exam. And as always, I'll catch you in the next video. Bye.